On Monday and Tuesday of Passion Week, the last week of Jesus' life, he signed his death warrant. And he did this by overturning the tables in the temple on Monday and then engaging in a verbal sparring battle with its leaders on Tuesday. He had to be killed. But it was Passover, and Passover is a dangerous time in Jerusalem. I mean, it's it's a, uh, a feast that celebrates Israel's liberation from slavery to Egypt. I mean, anti-Roman sentiment is at an all-time high. Therefore, Rome just flooded the streets of Jerusalem with soldiers. And if uh, the Pharisees, the leaders, were to kill a popular prophet among the people, there would be a riot. Thousands could potentially be slaughtered, and Rome might insist on a different leadership structure in Israel and take them out of power. This had to be avoided at all costs. Therefore, um, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests, they resolved to arrest Jesus after the feast. Look at this in Matthew 26. Um, they plotted together after Jesus just totally defeated him. Uh, all of the religious leaders um, in a verbal battle, they plotted, we're going to arrest this guy. We are going to kill him, but we have to do so by stealth, not during the feast. It can't be during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. But Jesus was killed during the feast. He was killed on Passover itself. Good Friday. Um, why? Why? Give you a hint. This guy, Judas. Um, Judas's betrayal of Jesus allowed uh, the religious leadership in Jerusalem to ascertain the location of Jesus in the middle of the night on Thursday. And their goal, the goal of the chief priests, was to arrest Jesus in secret, was to um, try him in court, and to execute him while the city slept. Now, this wasn't an easy task. Honestly, they had to move heaven and earth to make this happen. I mean, think about it. They had to ready the Sanhedrin, um, uh, a, a court of 70 members for a midnight trial. You try to do that. That's not easy. They had, they had to do that in one day. And they had to arrange with Pilate for a cohort of soldiers to arrest Jesus. They had to schedule an early morning trial with Pilate on Friday morning. Um, they had a really busy Wednesday after they were totally shamed on Tuesday. Well, Jesus, he had a busy Wednesday as well. He had a lot of preparations he had to take care of. Um, first off, he had to arrange a location for him and his disciples to keep the Passover. Now, the thing is, he had to communicate that location to his disciples in a way that Judas wouldn't know. Obviously, if you were to tell Judas straight away, I'm going to keep the Passover at this guy's house, well, then Judas is going to go right to the Sanhedrin and say, all right, go to this location. That's where you're going to arrest him. But that's not how it happened. Jesus was really sneaky. You see, what he did is he told a couple of his disciples, all right, this is how you're going to find where we're going to keep the Passover. You know, go walk around Jerusalem in a specific location. Look for a guy holding a jug on his shoulders. And men never wore or never carried water jugs. So it's a pretty unusual sight. And when you see this unusual sight, you know, talk with that guy. He'll take you to where we are going to keep the Passover. Judas didn't know where it would be until the moment of, until his presence was required. Perfect plan. Well, having done that, Jesus is going to hold the Passover with his disciples, the Last Supper, his final moments to prepare his disciples before his death. And he chooses in this moment to explain to them the meaning of his death. He says, he holds up a cup and he says, this is the blood of the covenant, the new covenant. Uh, my blood will inaugurate the new covenant. But he also promises that this Passover meal will, even though he's going towards his death, it will not be the last Passover meal he has with his disciples. Look at this in 26, 29. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins, taking us back to Matthew chapter one. But I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine until the day 
when I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. The kingdom, it's not here yet, but it's coming. And on that day, I will drink of um, the fruit of this vine yet again. But even having done that, Jesus wasn't ready yet himself. He prepared his disciples, but he wasn't ready yet himself. He needed more time to prepare his soul. Um, and therefore, after Judas left, right, Judas is going to leave the Last Supper. He's going to go right to the Sanhedrin. He's going to rush over there. He's probably sweating. He's like, I know where Jesus is. I know where Jesus is. But Jesus needs more time. So surprisingly, he's like, all right, everyone up, everyone up. Um, we're going to leave the upper room. And the disciples are like, why? It's like it's like 10 p.m. We're in the upper room. This place is nice. Can't we just spend the night here, Jesus? And he's like, no, no, no. We're going to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, even though it's very late at night, come with me. Um, we need to pray. And Jesus does pray. He prays three times that this cup would be taken away from him. But he trusts in the Father's will. He has faith. And he says, not my will, but yours be done, my good and gracious father. Well, after a rather embarrassing moment for Judas, where he takes a cohort of soldiers to the upper room, kicks down the door, and he finds it empty, well, he thinks really fast, and he's like, well, Jesus really likes to spend time with this one garden outside of the city. Come with me, soldiers. He has to be there. And he was. And after Jesus betrays, or Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss, Jesus is arrested. He's taken back to Jerusalem where he faces a mock trial. Now, this is a trial. Um, this is a trial of several steps. And we learn from a harmonization of the Gospels that there's actually six separate trials. Six trials which take place over the middle of the night, Thursday night before Friday morning. Take a look at this chart. These are complicated trials, I warn you. But the first thing that you have to realize about them is they took place in the middle of the night. His Jesus' disciples were asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas had to come and bring the soldiers with him, and, and, and they were carrying lanterns because it was so dark. After Jesus is arrested and Peter follows him to Jerusalem, Peter has to warm himself by the fire because it's cold at night. The rooster crows the following morning. And then uh, Matthew says explicitly, after those trials, when morning came. Now, there are six of these trials, one, two, three, four, five, six, and the first of which is before Annas. Now, Annas is the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the present high priest, and he is actually the former high priest. And they take him to Annas first, probably because they're just trying to buy time until the rest of the Sanhedrin can be gathered. They're trying to get all the 70 members there, but it takes a little bit of time. They haven't quite done it yet. So Annas is going to look for an accusation, and then, he, and then kind of once the Sanhedrin's gathered, he sends them to Caiaphas, the high priest, where he's questioned before the entire Sanhedrin, but Jesus remains silent until they put him under oath. And having done that, Jesus admits to being the son of man from Daniel 7. They tear their clothes. They say, this is enough. And they send him into the prison where um, Jesus is during the middle of the night. And the Sanhedrin is going to reconvene in the morning at first light, 5 a.m. probably, because everybody knows that you can't have a legal trial in the middle of the night. That's not allowed. Therefore, they have to wait until the crack of dawn to, to make an official verdict, and they uh, squeeze out that same confession from Jesus, being the Son of Man. And having done that, they send him to Pilate. They arranged on Wednesday for a, uh, a scheduled meeting with Pilate early in the morning on Friday, and so they do. Take him to Pilate, and they ask him, hey, we want an accusation against Jesus. We, we want a sentence um, uh, without a trial. And, you know, Pilate says, that's not good enough, buddy. So he's going to have a private interview with Jesus. And he says, I find no guilt in this man. He is innocent. And Pilate honestly attempts to release Jesus again and again. But the people insist that Jesus is a troublemaker. Um, he's stirred up trouble up in Galilee. And as soon as Pilate hears the word Galilee, he's like, oh, Galilee, thank goodness. Galilee is not my jurisdiction. It's Herod's jurisdiction. And he's in town. It's the Passover. Uh, send Jesus to Herod. Not my problem. So he does. He's sent to Herod. And, you know, after 
mocking him, abusing him a little bit. He finds him guiltless. So Herod sends him back to Pilate. And Pilate's like, oh, I have to deal with this again. But he's had a little bit of time to think about this. And he's like, okay, I've got an idea. I'm going to bypass um, the Sanhedrin, totally go around them and just ask the people. I'll ask the people to release him. They will. Um, and that will be more just. Fantastic idea. But the chief priests, they had already convinced the people to ask not for Jesus, but for Barabbas, which they do. And Pilate's like, oh, foiled again. How I want to release this guy, but you're not letting me. However, when the people threaten Pilate finally by saying, if you release this guy who is a rival claimant to the throne, who says he's a king, then you are not Caesar's friend. Ooh, and now Pilate gets a little bit nervous because Pilate, he's not on very good terms with Caesar. And if there's more rumors about um, Pilate and, and his potentially anti-Caesar activity, well, then he may be removed of his authority as well. So Pilate washes his hands of this whole affair and releases Jesus to be crucified. This is maybe seven, eight o'clock in the morning and Jesus hangs on a cross at 9 a.m. Well, there is darkness um, over Jerusalem from the sixth hour, that is about 12 o'clock, midday until 3 p.m. Um, this darkness is a sign of God's displeasure uh, at the death of his son, but also of his judgment on sin, sin that is in the body of Jesus. God is judging that sin. And then finally, there at the ninth hour, Jesus yields up his spirit and he dies. And then an earthquake shakes the ground and the curtain in the temple is torn in half thereby you know, opening up our access to God the Father through the, the living way that is made through the, the death of Jesus. And there's a whole bunch of little mini resurrections signaling what will happen at the end of the age, thanks to Jesus's death on our behalf. Um, and then finally, the centurion, look what the centurion says when he witnesses all of these things after the death of Jesus. Important, important words issued not by um, a Jewish follower of Jesus, but rather by a Gentile centurion, um, another important centurion in this book, who says, truly, this was the Son of God. You see, it was never more clear. Jesus's crown was never more clear than when he hung on the cross. Look at all of these references to Jesus being a king, being the son of God um, as he's approaching the cross. Um, in chapter 26, a woman anoints him with expensive ointment, uh, preparing him for his death. But also remember, kings were anointed. This is an anointing of the king um, and also a preparation for burial. Jesus says when he's arrested, don't you know that I can appeal to my father as the king and receive 12 legions of angels? And throughout the entire trial sequence, there's this language of kingship constantly. Tell us, are you the Christ, the son of God? You will see the son of man. Are you the king of Jews? You have said that it is. Yes, I am. Um, they try to release uh, or... Um, Pilate offers to release Jesus in place of Barabbas, and, and Barabbas's name literally means son of the father. Um, Jesus is called the Christ. The soldiers mock him and put on all of this kingly garb, a crown, a scepter, a reed. They kneel before him. They cry, hail, king of the Jews. Um, Jesus's sentence nailed to the cross is Jesus, king of the Jews. He's called the Son of God three times as he hangs on the cross, the Son of God and the King of Israel. Paul makes this connection for us so beautifully in his hymn in Philippians chapter 2, where it says that Jesus was found in human form and he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And because of Jesus's death on the cross, God highly exalted him as king of Israel and as king of the nations. 
and bestowed on him a name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Messiah. He is Messiah. He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And therefore, we are not surprised that after the empty tomb, after Jesus' resurrection, he says, all authority has been given to me. I have conquered death. And through my death, I have invited my followers into a new covenant where they can access eternal life with me. Matthew was going to close out his gospel with Jesus's marching orders, the marching orders of the king to his subjects. And even though during his earthly life, Jesus was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he's going to send his disciples to all the nations. Let's jump to that great commission. All authority is mine, Jesus says. Therefore, make disciples of all nations. And this is how you're going to do it. Make disciples by going, by baptizing, and by teaching um, everyone to observe what I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, this is going to take us all the way back to the beginning of Matthew's gospel, where Jesus is called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. He's with us to the end of the age. Now, when will that be? Well, in Jesus's final discourse, before he goes to the cross, he tells his disciples that this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come.